Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, and the actions that we undertake in the world be aligned with the journey and the path that you have laid out before us. Amen. This morning I'll start with the reading from James. Uh, James is interesting compared to many of the other epistles, the other letters in the New Testament, because most of the letters and the ones that uh, are attributed to Paul are named after their recipient. So like when Paul wrote to Christians in Rome, they called that letter Romans. James is different because James is named based on who wrote it, not to whom it was written. Uh, if you go back to the beginning of James, you see that uh, James was written to uh, the believers in the dispersion, or the diaspora is another word for that. Um, early Christians, like Jews as well, were scattered in the ancient world. They had little colonies in places where they were building up gatherings all around. And so James was writing to that scattered community. It's widely believed that James, as a text, reflects the, uh, the Christians who were living in Jerusalem. So if you imagine the early Jesus movement, right, the center of that movement was Jerusalem. That was where Jesus's family was. That was where his brother, James, who this epistle might be named after, um, might even be based on things that that James wrote. We, we don't know from the text. But James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem and the most influential leader for a couple decades uh, in the early church movement. But what happened, if you remember your history, in 70 CE, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple burnt to the ground, and not only were the Jewish people scattered, but also the, the, the Jewish people who were following Jesus, who were beginning to branch off and form their own movement, they were also scattered. Possibly a, a, a number of Christian leaders in Jerusalem were killed at that time. And so what happens is we have, we don't have a lot of information about what the early church was like in Jerusalem. We have a lot more information from Paul because Paul was not in Jerusalem when this happened. He was founding churches everywhere else in the world and so his churches weren't destroyed by the Roman Empire. They persisted and he lived to write more letters and so we have a lot more of Paul's theology and his thoughts than the ones that might be contrasting with those from Jerusalem. And this passage is one of those really stark contrasts that I just kind of wish we knew more about. So who here has heard the phrase that we are saved by grace through faith? Or maybe you've heard that shortened, you know, to faith alone saves us. That is a very Paul idea. We get that from Paul. That's the heart of his theology. It's interesting because in this reading from James, James says in contrast, can faith save you? He asked the question, can faith save you? And the implied answer from the text at that point is no, not by itself. James calls out empty words that sound kind of Christian on the surface. So he talks about how if you have someone who's starving or doesn't have enough clothing, they're cold, and you say to them, go in peace, my brother, my sister, you haven't done anything for them. You're just, you're sounding Christian, you feel like you're expressing your faith, but you've done nothing concrete for that purpose for that person. What it made me thought of as I what it made me think of as I read that is the idea of every time there's a, a shooting 
that gets into the news, people offer thoughts and prayers, which sounds very Christian, very pious. But like, how many times do you offer thoughts and prayers before the underlying problem has to be addressed? In the same way, how many times can you say to someone who's starving, go in peace, go in peace, go in peace, peace of Christ, before you have to address the fact that they're starving and, and how do we get that person fed? And is a person of faith someone who says thoughts and prayers or someone who says go in peace? Or is a person of faith someone who feeds the hungry and ends violence, makes peace? And so James comes to the conclusion, rather famously, that faith without works is dead. Faith on its own in a vacuum is nothing. So then, what we do is really important. What those works are is really important. And James has some ideas of what those kinds of works might look like, what we should be focusing on, and so does our reading from the Psalms. I've seen a quote attributed to a lot of different people, and honestly, I think now that like generative AI has, is taking over the internet, it's really hard to figure out who said anything. Because if you try to look up who said a quote, you're going to get six or seven different people it's attributed to, and no citations, and it's it's more challenging to figure out where things came from. One person this has been attributed to is a philosopher named Sam Johnson, because I like to give credit, but in this case, I'm not sure how to give credit. But the quote goes something like this. You can easily judge the character of a person based on how they treat people who can't do anything for them. You can easily judge someone's character based on how they treat people who can't do anything for them. We can all be gracious when we need something. We can be patient, we can be thoughtful when we need something from someone. Or when there's some way that this person could benefit us. Maybe they have authority over us. Maybe they have an influence on our life. Maybe they're scary and we want to feel safe. Maybe we like them and they want us to like, maybe we like them and they want them to like us. But we can generally treat people well if we need something from them. If we need them to do something for us. But when someone has nothing to offer us, what they're doing, we don't care about. What they have, we don't want. How we treat a person in that situation says a lot more about us. Scripture, from cover to cover, is overwhelmingly concerned with how we treat people who we see as not being able to do anything for us. People who are poor, who don't have resources that we need. People who are vulnerable and who need help and protection rather than being able to provide help and protection to us. The psalm gives us some examples of this. Generosity is defined as sharing with the poor. And it says that God pleads the case of the poor on their behalf. And the passage closes by saying God despoils those who despoil vulnerable people. Despoil, you could say exploit, harm. But God despoils those who despoil. God chooses a side. It's another way of saying that. God has chosen a side and continues to choose a side. And the side that God chooses isn't the righteous poor. It isn't the people who are vulnerable and deserving. Those are not distinctions that the Bible is very interested in. 
Those are judgments that are often judgments that we make. Sure, this person needs something, but are they deserving? Have they done something to earn it? In contrast is a concept that even like little kids can figure out with no prompting. You feed someone because they're hungry. You find someone a home because they don't have a home. Not because they've done anything to earn those things. So why is this idea important? It could be just that we're taking the Bible at face value, reading the words that are in it, and trying to live that out. James says, faith, faith without works is dead. Got it. What do those, words, what do those works look like? Showing mercy and justice to the poor and vulnerable. Got it. But like underneath that, what's going on? Like, it, Yes, it's important. Yes, we should do it. But why? I think one reason is that how we respond to people who are poor and vulnerable is how we are measured ourselves by God. And that God judges societies. God judges people as groups. And the standard that God uses consistently is how are the poor and the vulnerable treated. A more efficient way of saying it is the poor tell us who we are. They tell us who we are. So imagine you see someone who's sleeping outside. And we all have thoughts when we see someone who's sleeping outside. A generous thought might be that that person is unfortunate. But there are also less generous thoughts we might have. Thinking about how it came to be that they're in that situation and we're not. We might think that person was foolish, made bad choices. We might think they're an addict, lazy, unskilled, And it's encouraging in kind of a twisted way to think that way because it separates us from them. If we can say they earned their bad situation, we can say I earned my good situation if I'm in a, if I'm in a good situation. And I won't end up like that person because I'm not those negative things I presume about them. Even though it's pretty rare to go and find out what that person's story actually is. But no, that person shows us who we are. When we do what's right, the same is true. Right? When we, when we find that person who's sleeping outside and we find them a place to live and we find them the support that they need and we give them counseling and we give them a caseworker and the resources they need to flourish, that also shows us who we are. It isn't always negative, but the measure is consistent, at least where Scripture is concerned. If the poor are doing well, you're doing well. If the poor are doing badly, you're doing badly. And we don't like being reminded of this in general, it is uncomfortable to have who we are on display in that way. And so we like to hide the people who tell us who we are. Even in Phoenixville, we have great reasons to be proud of this town, right? How many nonprofits do we have in Phoenixville? Anybody know? Over 100? We have a lot. I've heard over 60, I've heard over 70 probably every count, you're going to have more. So we have loads of nonprofits. We have lots of resources. We live, in a, we live in a great place. 
Like people who visit Phoenixville will say that is a really that is a great place to live. At the same time, it's very common that there's no there's no place to stay in a shelter here. And over and over again, people are told if you want a place to sleep that's indoors, you have to go to Coatesville. Because Coatesville has beds, often, not always, while Phoenixville has resources. At the same time, last year, there were 50 high school kids who were sleeping in a car at Phoenixville High School. 50 that they know of. You probably wouldn't be able to tell to look at them. I would never have guessed that there were 50 homeless kids in Phoenixville High School. At the same time, if you talk to the executive director of PAX, she'll tell you that for the last four years, need that they have answered has increased by 50 to 70 percent. Those of you who are good at math, what happens if something increases by 50 to 70 percent every year? It doubles and triples and quadruples very quickly. And that is consistently, that's the past four years, it's been going in that direction. On the smaller scale, we love that there are wonderful restaurants for us to visit and, and bars and distilleries for us to visit in Phoenixville. And we love that there are people working there who will wait on us. And we don't often think about how none of them can afford to live nearby. We love to have people available to serve us. We're not always really concerned about whether they can be our neighbors. The poor tell us who we are. We don't like it, but I think we intuit that it's true. People who were the original audience of biblical texts didn't like it either. And that's why the psalmist had to remind them that God pleads the case of the poor and despoils those who despoil them. And James had to remind them that faith without works is dead. To say pious, Christian-sounding things while not helping someone materially is dead. It's why the prophets had to warn Israel, you will be destroyed if you continue to abuse the poor. And the prophets were ignored, and Israel was destroyed. It's why Jesus, one of the last things he says is, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. And whatever you fail to do for the least of these, you fail to do for me. All of this to continually remind us that the poor tell us who we are. Amen.